it's done, then I expect you to take all of the fire that burned me down to break the peace. We got shot. Hey, is this Sam? Hey, yeah, is this Jay? Hey, Sam. Yeah, this is Jason from the Seven Inches uh, blog. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Very good. So you sent me your um, Dorm Life Dr. Manhattan Split 7-inch, and that's how I first yeah. heard about Alarm Clock Revolution. And um, mm -hmm. I was just looking into stuff today and, um, you know, just looking at you guys have been around since 2005, and your band is Dorm Life, and, and you're the lead singer. Um, mm -hmm. how did this, how did this whole thing start? Was it, was it a band first and you decided you need to, you know, put out your own stuff or did you always have an idea to do a label? Like where, where did this all start for you? Basically, I mean, I, I, it all kind of started when I, when I started really pursuing music, um, it, when I was in high school, uh, you know, 2000, 2001, like my senior year, mm -hmm. um, I, I was granted an opportunity by a friend in high school. Um, her, her father had taken an interest in my music and I was writing solo stuff. I was in a pop punk band before that and I was just writing like acoustic stuff mm -hmm. and it was, it was total pop, you know, going for this almost, you know, radio friendly stuff. And mm -hmm. it, it wasn't, it was definitely wasn't punk or indie or anything, even though I came from that background. And, uh, regardless, he, he took me and, and had me record in Chicago at this analog studio and he hired all these studio musicians. Wow. And, and I was, it was, it was, I'm forever indebted to him because mm -hmm. I learned so much. I learned how to play in a metronome. I learned how to be a studio musician, you know? Wow, yeah. Uh, but come along with that, somebody pays for you to do stuff. Mm -hmm. When you're on somebody else's budget, they have all the creative control. Right. And I learned quickly my senior year. I mean, you know, I was, I was doubling up, you know, you know, I work, I'd, I'd go to school and I'd get off school and I'd, I'd go to Chicago, you know, at night during wow. the, the weeks, you know, and I'd record and, and I, I remember we'd fight <laughs> oh, really? over, over, over just like little minor details, but he wanted to add like an organ to the song. And I was like, no, that sounds kind of hokey, you know, <laughs> but, but regardless, this guy was, was definitely, um, he taught me, he said, you know, if you get signed to a major label and this is what you want to do with your life, yeah. he's like, this is what you're going to go through. Cause he was in a band, um, kind of in the vein of like Steely Dan, you know, okay. in the seventies. And okay. he was, he was, they were signed to like, I, I think what, what had become, um, United Artists. Um, and then basically got shelved and, you know, all his dreams were shattered. <laughs> yeah, right. So he was, just, he was just trying to pass things along to me and sure. I really appreciated that. And, and that's really where it all came from was, was the positive yet negative experience of having <laughs> somebody else pay for you to do something. Right. You never, you never, I mean, you, you do appreciate it, but when you don't get to have that creative control and you don't put every ounce of your own money and effort into it, um, I don't think you truly grasp, you know, what your, what your end goal is. Right. Right. And, uh, and so that, that made me immediately, I was like a kid who, who basically was, let's just say like as a metaphor here, you know, I, I was under, I was under a strict, uh, guideline and, mm -hmm. you know, it's like a, a kid that rebels who's been in church their whole life or been in a public school or a boarding school or whatever have yeah. you. I was like, forget this. I'm going totally indie and doing my own thing. And yeah. at the time I was, at the time I was really into, uh, Jimmy E. World's clarity. <laughs> and, okay. Okay. And that, that was really a driving force, uh, in, in kind of creating my next project, um, and that's, I pretty much jammed that, that album for a year and a half straight. Mm -hmm. And when they had released their second album, I, or their third album, I should say, um, I was, I was pretty disappointed. It was just too poppy. Mm -hmm. And, and I was, so I formed a band called Midwest Blue and I decided to do the whole thing, you know, indie and it was, it ended up pretty, turning out pretty bad. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the first, the first EP we did, okay. but it was a great, great starting block. You know, we, we had all the creative control and, then, then it, it just forced me to want to do better. And, yeah. you know, so we started, we, we found a producer, we found this guy that had recorded a bunch of bands from Chicago and um, had recently done a seven inch for a band that had gotten on the Emo Diaries. And uh, my relationship with him basically kind of, I, 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 we just worked really well together. Mm -hmm. I mean, he wasn't, he wasn't like a producer who told you what to do. Mm -hmm. He just had an amazing ear and he made you 
work for it, he said, you know, if you're, uh, if, if you were, if he'd be like, if say I did a bad job, he'd be like, great, that was perfect, do it again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and it was just that kind of relationship that kind of basically made me record, I think, what, three full lengths with him, you know, two with, with Midwest Blue, and then, um, you know, I formed Dorm Life as a side project that ended up turning into, like, my kind of love. Oh, wow, yeah, <laughs> and, okay. And, and uh, we recorded our first album with Craig, um, and that, that was kind of, we had had some interest from the label that had, that had uh, released Midwest Blue. We had some interest from another label that was up and coming that probably would have been a really good choice to got, go to, but at the time it just didn't seem like it was the, the right thing for us. Right. So so after, you know, talks with different labels, they're all, you know, small, independent labels, I just said to myself, you know, I'm really sick of, of uh, dealing with other people and and waiting for them to get the deadlines together, mm-hmm. you know, I'm just going to save my money. I'm going to book, I'm going to book some tours here. Um, and I called it alarm clock, uh, because of the previous EP that was released by Midwest blue. We had pretty much released that EP and we were, we had big plans to tour and the guys just didn't want to. Okay. And the guys from dorm life just stepped in. They're like, let's, let's do it. I, you know, we got this, this full length, let's press it, you know? Yeah. So I just call it, I call it alarm clock kind of like wake up. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's, and it was called Alarm Clock Records, and my friend, I had a friend who kind of co-founded it with me. Um, she was kind of helping me fund it. Mm-hmm. Um, and we had, a, we had a falling out later, and so I changed it to Revolution instead okay. of Record. Okay. So that's how that came about. Sorry if that's a way too long of a story. No, here. no. I think, I think that stuff is the, the most important, you know, how, like, beginning evolution of, of a band and, and then how it turns into a label. And, I mean, that's that's the interesting stuff to me you know so and another thing another thing i didn't throw in there was also at that same time that i was graduating high school and starting midwest blue uh there was a band that was on the rise called the alkaline trio yeah sure if you've heard of alkaline trio and i went to i went to mchenry west campus in uh-huh. illinois um uh so matt skiba went to uh east campus in mchenry and he was you know it's like i think he graduated seven years before me okay so it also made me realize, like, whoa, like, this, this, the Fireside Bowl and all of Chicago, and this is such a great scene to be part mm-hmm. of. I, I have, like, this, like, like the sky's the limit, basically, and, and seeing somebody from my hometown, you know, just totally become the next big punk band, you know, yeah. to, to be all over the map, you yeah. know, it was, like, very uh, motivational. Yeah. So that, that was the other part of it, I would, I would say, the part of the equation, growing up in that whole area of Chicago and having, you know, like, bands like Slapstick and... 88 Fingers Louie and Alkaline Trio and all those bands kind of, you know, influencing what we were doing okay. as far as the, as far as the ethics approach, maybe not the style. As far as the blueprint for Alarm Clock, it was mm-hmm. basically the same as Asian Man. I mean, I, Mike Park has been one of my favorite uh, people that I've ever met and that okay. I've ever gotten a chance to hang out with. And uh, he like, definitely inspired me to start Alarm Clock. So <clears throat> that was kind of the idea, just handshakes and, mm-hmm. you know, Going back to that high school story of the studio and the guy that helped me, mm-hmm. he told me he told me one day, "Hey, you got to pay this forward. I'm spending a lot of money on you, and one day I hope that you're in a position where you can do the same for other people." And I said, "Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know, I'm going to." And, and you know, when you're young, you think, "Yeah, I will, maybe, you know, whatever." And then you do your own thing, and you're putting all your money into yourself. Mm-hmm. And so alarm alarm clock became quickly. I mean, I, I got a chance to put out Unique Chic, and. I, I worked my butt off to just save enough to press that CD, mm-hmm. and and I I just believed in it so much because I hadn't heard something that beautiful since American Football. And uh, and they had they were plus I kind of felt guilty because they were they were actually on they were the newest signees to the label that put out Midwest Blue Post Four Three Six Records. Okay. And they just they just weren't it wasn't working. I don't know what happened with the deadlines with the CDs and mm-hmm. pressing and 
for whatever reason, like they felt like they were being strung around for a whole year and they were supposed to have an album out, you know, eight months ago. (laughs) Yeah. So, so it was, I got it pressed just in time for, for the new year, right before the new year hit. So it was still within the same year that they wanted it. And that was kind of the first thing is like kind of putting, putting, uh, you know, your money, you know, into other people and, and, uh, Unique Sheik came along. They were the the perfect. They were that. That's absolutely my favorite thing that I've ever released. Yeah, I, uh, I was listening to that today. It's. I, I think you described it as uh, Jeff Buckley, like fronting it, Sea and Cake, which I think is is great. But I, yeah, I'm, I actually, really I wish this. I could, I wish I could take credit for that statement. <laughs> okay. But that was actually, that was actually um, a direct quote uh, from Bob Nana from Braid and Hammer Mercedes. Oh wow! Um, he he gave that to them for the CD, which was really nice too to try to sell some units. <laughs> okay, that's so, awesome. Did you like deal with them and their sound at all? I mean, in terms of like you know you working with that guy um, in high school no, and stuff. Did you have they, anything to do with that? I you know I had nothing to do with the production yeah. of that record. I I I met that band like at the beginning of Midwest Blue, like and maybe three years well however many years later like fast forward from 2002 i think we played a show with them in chicago mm-hmm. at this crappy little dive bar mm-hmm. and i was just like no way this is the most beautiful music i've ever heard wow. i hope somebody puts this out yeah you know? yeah and uh and i just i they were just doing they were doing the same thing we were they were grinding you know just trying to play shows right and they were a little little older than me and they had been in other bands and whatnot and i, I don't know if they 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 ended up touring, but I think they were kind of losing energy too. Yeah. At the same time, it's like when you're doing something for so long, it's it just took way too long for that album to come out, and it was mm-hmm. it's just a master. It's uh, it was recorded by Scott Adamson, uh, who who produced. Um, I think he did some stuff with Owen. Okay. Um, he did he did uh, Colossal, The Honor System, um, I think The Ghost. Um, I think Scott Adamson actually was in. Um, Sweet the Like Johnny, if you ever heard of Sweet the Like Johnny, oh, wow. or or Justifier, okay. he was in that band as well. Oh, wow, that's crazy. It's, it's uh, that's kind of like the the main thing. There's Unique Chic. Um, I just felt like, wow, I'm going to put out an album better than anything I'll ever write. <laughs> <laughs> so, so it was it was it was a no brainer for me. And from from that point on, I just my goal is personally as a musician was. I, I felt that I wanted to release new material every year, mm-hmm. and and that's not as a as a label, but just as an artist. And mm-hmm. I figured, you know, I'm just going to release my own records, and maybe maybe some people will be interested. You know, this way, this way, I'm kind of like my own driving force, and we'll see what happens. And I mean, I could go into all kinds of history about all the bands that we right. played with, and all the bands that we know, and yeah. and all the opportunities we we got or could have got, and yeah. I don't. All that stuff is just whatever. I mean, we're we're actually working on a, a documentary right now on the band. Oh wow! And it's just going to be kind of a hilarious story. I mean, of just basically, you know, what it's like to be in a band and right. not not really ever obtain your your hopeful uh, success. I guess defined by uh, you know making a living. But, right, uh, right, right. But working on something, and we actually, I don't know. We got a lot of ideas, but it's it's kind of hard now that I've moved away. Mm-hmm. And uh, I don't know if there was anything else in the catalog you were you, you were you had heard at all. Um, yeah, no, I've I've been listening to all all this stuff today. Um, it, it's crazy. I actually meant to sort of ask you about. I mean, the some of this stuff is. I mean, you have this uh, unique chic that's you know, like we said, is very kind of somber and and really uh, really beautiful. And then and then you have. Uh, Stuff like uh, Boom Juice, which is uh, kind of like this sort of hip hop kind of loose sort of soul stuff. So it's kind yeah. of funny this this sort of range of um, things that you you put out on the label. I mean, it seems like you know, does it end like up being? Why? How does how does that fit? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I I mean, I'm, I'm assuming it's just sort of like friends and, and people that you just have these relationships with, and and it turns into into a record. And I mean, I think that's yeah. what makes labels like Alarm Clock Revolution like so interesting. You know, yeah, I mean, I would say again, going back to Asian Man Records, you know, they started off as just a straight punk rock, you know, in ska label, mm-hmm. and 
and I, I got a chance to do a bike tour, a bicycle tour. It was, it was a bicycle for peace tour okay. back in 2005. And um, so basically the whole goal was um, they were raising money for yeah. a, an all-ages venue, mm -hmm. to put an all-ages venue in, in the city. Oh, that's great. And, and there was none, absolutely none, especially wow. being like the 10th largest city in the U.S. You'd think that they would have some sort of, um, you know, some sort of outlet for, for teens mm -hmm. besides, besides sports and, right. and all those other things right. that it can do. For me, I mean, music kept me out of trouble. So I was like, first off, this is a really great cause, and I mm -hmm. think I can donate to it, and I think I can raise money from people to do it. And I really love riding my bicycle. I used to ride from McHenry to Elgin all the time, mm -hmm. and that, that was a good 25-mile ride. Wow. And um, so I felt, oh, that's cool. Plus, plus I get to meet Mike Park. <laughs> nice. So I figured, you know, I want to do it, and yeah. uh, and I and I, I did it, and and we actually Dan Pothas from ME330, he he was he was on the tour. Uh, two of the guys from RX Bandits, Matt Embry and Steve Choi. Uh, I forget who else was on it. Um, I think one of the guys from Finch, Randy, was mm -hmm. on it okay. um, for a little portion, and uh, Jenny Choi, and then a bunch of people actually from upstate here, which I. Still have yet to connect with again. I, I should probably do that at some point. <laughs> but um, you know, I just met a lot of people that were just down. You know, they were yeah. just really cool, and I think that's cool when you can just say, "I'm going to donate some money to this cause. I'm going to fly myself out to Seattle." Wow! And we literally rode our bikes from Olympia, Washington, to San Diego. Wow! And <laughs> down the one, and it was just an wow. adventure. And, and I know that Dan Dan Pot has actually our guy. He, I think he was working on a documentary. He has a little footage still, and I wonder if that'll ever see the light of day. <laughs> but I, I'm hoping to at least get some footage for our personal dorm life documentary. Yeah, but, uh, wow. But anyways, so um, back to the Asian man thing. Um, you know, meeting meeting Mike on that tour, I remember riding my bike alongside him, and we were just talking <laughs> about the history of Asian man. You know, it's so inspiring to me. And he would talk about how it was Bill first, and he went through that whole story. And uh, then it turned into Asian Man. And then he talked about, because it was about that time, 2003, 2003 to like 2005, when he was really expanding his sound mm -hmm. and, and, and getting outside that, that box. Mm -hmm. And he found, he told me, he said, you know, I started with, with this like blueprint and I was like the go-to punk ska label. Mm -hmm. And I grossed over 2 million my first year. Wow. You know? Wow. And and he said he said and that's where people were coming to look for it and I love I wanted to branch out but he said that for him since he had started off like that you know that people were losing interest because they didn't they were coming for Punk and Sky that was right. his, you know, that was his market right so it didn't make sense for him he ended up losing a lot of money on bands that I was in love with like Colossal that I I got to actually play with. Flash got to play on on one of our Midwest blues songs with a trumpet line, you know. And <laughs> for me, like bands like Colossal and Justifier, these bands that were just outside the box, yeah, really cool. And and he he was basically telling me, yeah, it wasn't a good idea. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I mean, it was a good idea, right? But it was it wasn't a profitable idea, and right. probably would. You know, and you've seen lately, I think I don't know if you've paid attention to Asian, maybe he's kind of got back into that. Um, you know where he where he came from, right, right, right. You know, with that, but uh, you know that kind of made me think. Yeah. When I was just starting the label, then I had only released the Dorm Life record. I was about to release Unique Chic, and I was thinking, you know, I just don't want to limit myself yeah. to to any genre. I I like to almost be like a major label in the sense that I'll put out any type of music mm -hmm. at all. Mm -hmm. And being a '90s kid, I mean, I was really into. I mean, I was into hip hop. I was into R and B. Right. I mean, I mean, my voice. I was 
strongly influenced by a lot of soul singers, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So, so uh, <clears throat> anyways, and, and that was kind of the idea, and that's that's where Alarm Clock's been. It's like I won't ever turn, you know, I'll, I'll never uh, shun any style of mm-hmm, music. It mm-hmm. has to have substance, in it, and they have to be really good people. Right. In, in my opinion, and, and every per, every person that I've ever put music out by has been just a stand-up individual. Right. And I think right. that's the same. That's the same thing with you know labels like Asian Man and Discord. They only work with people that they that they trust. Mm-hmm. You know, it's a handshake mm-hmm. deal. There's no contract, and that's to me that's the way life should be. It's it's better when there isn't so much of a plan, maybe you know, and you're yeah. not looking yeah. at like, well, I gotta sell uh, this, you know this many records mm-hmm. well, so I'll, I'll have these guys put another something out you know that you might not mm-hmm. even be behind so it's not that it's it's also a, you know a matter of can i afford to put, put an album out or, right. or am i willing to literally like take a hit on you know everything right now and say right. oh i could i could spend 1600 bucks and press a, a cd that probably won't sell in today's market for right. sure right but but or you know you know, it's just, uh, it's become, lately, I've been really liking doing co-releases. Mm-hmm. And and that's what I've been doing a lot of, the last few releases have been co-releases. And that that's just nice. I mean, Duck Phone Records, my my buddy Gino, I mean, he's, he's he was uh, the sound guy for Plain White Tees. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and he, uh, I mean, he's he's on tour, I think, you know, half half to three quarters of the year you know mm-hmm. all over the place going overseas and he's a really good guy wow. and so he's he's always down he's, he's been one of the most helpful people for me as a musician and then as a label he's been you know kind of meeting me halfway on the dorm life releases and that last split with dr manhattan so that that always lightens the load when you you know i mean you've with the sweaters and pearls you know <laughs> you, you, you've been uh been putting out you know co-releases as well with people and that probably is a, a big help for you you know it, it is in, it, it is in both hands it's like on, on one way it's it good financially and then also it sort of forces me to, to uh, get things done too you know like oh this guy's you know this guy's counting on me we got to get this thing like we got to get this art in and the records whatever pressed and everything on time mm-hmm. you know because because yeah it's not just me and and i can get lazy <laughs> yeah so i mean yeah it's uh I, I think as far as the other stuff in the catalog when when you get around to it that good night tonight cd is going to be pretty interesting yeah yeah and, i was checking that out as well It's uh, it's actually Matt, the singer of Doctor Manhattan, mm-hmm. and they were they were putting out their Vagrant album. They they had gotten signed to Vagrant, and for me, I, I hate to go fanboy, you know, on, mm-hmm. on that label. But I at, at the time, that was one of my. I mean, in high school, my buddy was on the street team. He had all the promo posters. He'd go to record <laughs> breakers and hang them. And and it, I remember when they had bands like No Motive and Boxer and and Go to Hell's and all these bands nobody had heard of. And Face to Face was their big band at the time obviously mm-hmm. um, and then they signed the get up kids and everything changed and, yeah. and I thought you know at that time I mean I was kind of you know in a band that was obtaining that sort of genre you know Midwest Blue was kind of of those like Hey Mercedes was one of my favorite bands you know mm-hmm. uh, and uh, so I had always personally been like oh I really if there was a label I could sign to that I feel that it could be successful and maybe even you know, complimentary to our style. I really like to go to Vega. And then, you know, 2007 hits and Dr. Manhattan signs to like my favorite label and they're my <laughs> friends. And I'm like, yeah, That's awesome. <laughs> this uh, is awesome. Yeah. You know, it was just like, I, and I, I've, you know, I've played with bands on all kinds of labels and 
I have friends that have been on major labels and but it was that was like a big special moment for me. It was when they when they signed that, that dotted line, you know, with Rich Egan and wow. John Cullen and that was really cool. And uh so when they put that record out, uh I figured you know, him you know, Matt Matt and Tracy had this solo two two EPs, you know, it's this good night, good night group. Mm-hmm. I I was just like that's it. I'm getting a second job. <laughs> oh, <wow. laughs> and, and yeah. So, so I got a, I got a, I got another temp. I was just working a temp job, and then I yeah. got another temp job, and I think I even was waiting tables at the time too. Oh, man. But um, so I, I put that record out, and it, it, that was probably the biggest hit I ever took. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> in, in the label's history, but wow. it was just. It just felt like the right time. Mm-hmm. It, they were mm-hmm. they were on tour with Save the Day mm-hmm. and all kinds of successful bands, you know. Yeah. And so I figured they could bring that on tour with them. Maybe maybe people will see the alarm clock label, whatever. Maybe not. Yeah, sure. And uh, so that was that was another kind of pay it forward deal, you know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. And what, then what's what's sort of your arrangement with with somebody like that? You just. I mean, you, you obviously know them and stuff, so it's not. I mean, you aren't like probably signing contracts and everything, but I mean, no, well, um, it's just honestly, it's just a handshake. We just yeah. hung out. You know, I I played many shows with Doctor Manhattan. I even played with Musket Arm, which was two of the guys in Doctor Manhattan's old band. And mm-hmm. you know, before when Dormus was just starting to tour and release our first record, mm-hmm. but um, you know, we we went way back, and I I knew them and and. I just I just said listen like my deal at alarm clock is just fifty fifty you know I'm mm-hmm. gonna put out the you put out the cost of recording it I'll mm-hmm. put out the cost of pressing it that's right. that's just how I feel I think that's fair yeah sure uh, and it's you know in a perfect world that would that would be ideal but um right but <clears throat> anyway so we so we did that and uh, and it's always worked out really well I mean the bands are always really honest they mm-hmm. keep track of things and mm-hmm. and. They've enabled me to put out other releases because they were honest, you know. Right, right, right. So it's it's they're doing the label a favor. They're doing themselves a favor, you know. Right. And uh, and I think that that alarm comp was that was the last thing I put out that was just you know again kind of you know to a, a bunch of other artists. And right. I would have gladly put out a record by almost every one of those artists. Yeah. What are you thinking so, for the future? I, there's been a couple bands. Um, there was this band, Lucinda. I put out an EP by them right when I was leaving. Okay. I, I say that I put it out. They, uh, I was the bass player from Midwest Blues band. He was playing drums in it. Mm-hmm. It, was a, it, it kind of sounded like Blink-182 in their Cheshire Cat days, but off time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and it was, I mean, I love those guys. I really do. I mean, it was just, Ryan was a better bass player than a drummer, but anyways, they put their money out to press, I think, 200 copies, and they were like, hey, would would you just put it on the site? Would you just kind of distribute it? And yeah. I don't know. I don't really know what that means, because I never really had distribution. So. Right, right. But they, they wanted to be part of the Alarm Clock family, and they're my friends. And yeah. So, so I just let them put the label on there, and I think they formed a new band called Farewell Anderson, and they're actually kind of going to do a deal like that now. And this new band that they're in is actually, to me, a lot better. But mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, I think they're going to be putting out an EP. I'm not sure, though. I, I, I don't know. Things are always, you know, changing. That's life, right? So, right, right. Um, but they have an EP, um, and I'm actually working on some dorm life stuff uh, when I go back in January to Chicago. Oh, wow. I'm going to go back, go back to Red Door Studios with Gino from Duck Phone and finish our cover of uh, The Broke Down uh, Brain, oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> which is interesting in itself. And uh-huh. um, and then we had a new song that we were writing for our, our Purple album, <laughs> wow. our fourth album. Wow. We have we also have a green album that we were working on called <laughs> Making Money Off of Friends, and that was, was going to be a, a benefit CD where we make money off of our friends by covering artists that nobody's ever really heard yeah. <laughs> and make it our own so it's almost our own record yeah wow, wow. <laughs> and uh that's that's been something in the works um the purple album is pretty much kind of written and you know i don't know what's going to happen with that because that takes a lot of work and getting together and jamming and yeah and i, I don't really have time for that <laughs> right right so so I've, I've got those on the back burner i've got a, a boom juice record on the back burner wow. um I've, 
I think I have, I've been writing a lot of different stuff. I'm in a project called My OK BBS, and I think we, I think the the guy who started it, I think he's changing the name to the Horchata Network. <laughs> and I have no idea. He wants me to sing in it, and it's going to be kind of like they might be giants. Oh, wow, um, okay. So that'll be interesting. <laughs> um, I don't know. I'm not again. I'm not the brain behind this one. I'm just kind of the the singer. Sure, sure. <laughs> wow. Uh, but we got that going on, and I'm sure that that it'll be very entertaining. Um, we'll just kind of postal service that one. Yeah, yeah. And, um, <laughs> and then I've also been working on a, uh, believe it or not, a, a gospel record. Oh wow! Wow, jeez. <laughs> a, a neo neo gospel, we'll call it that. Okay. And it, it's kind of interesting. Um, it's uh, you know something that I've you know part of who I am mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and uh, and I don't I don't show that on anyone you know at all and I, I, I put out records like I said you know the guy's in Unique Chic I think the singer is an atheist and, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know and I don't I don't hate on people I, I like the libertarian approach to to uh, you know politics myself uh-huh. Uh-huh. and uh, I don't I don't I believe I'm shoving my beliefs down people's throats but right, right. that being said I, I also still want to shine uh, for God myself mm-hmm. and I I've, I've made it a point not to not to really drop any f bombs or certain there's certain standards I have as a as a lyricist, you know. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, but I've I'm, I'm been working on this uh, project for a little while, and uh, we'll see how that goes. <laughs> I don't yeah. know. I don't wow. know that I'll ever. I don't know that I'll ever really get done with these projects. Right. And, right. You know, we got this. We just have you know our little our little boy, our first little uh, <laughs> baby here, Mandy yeah. and I. Congratulations! Left, That's awesome. It, he just turned six months and he's teasing and <laughs> it's like it's such a it's such an interesting uh experience. It really yeah. teaches you how to be selfless and wow. you don't realize like how much time you have before you have a kid. Yeah, right. And, and you it's like wow, I, I I'm lucky if I can even stay up late at night, <laughs> you know, after I've been rocking him to sleep, you know. Yeah. yeah. And I've been getting into video editing lately as well. I just got a MacBook and Oh nice. I've entered the Mac realm, yeah. and uh, <laughs> so I got I got Final Cut, and I just put up a, a music video for Cocaine by Dorm Life. We just I just saw shot. that. I was wondering did, if did uh, yeah, I did. I just watched that. That's crazy. So so you edited that and everything. Yeah, I, I mean it was. I only had five angles to work with. I used my wife's. Um, she has a uh, SLR. Mm-hmm. She has like a a Canon. Yeah, and I mean, it just I can't believe the quality that those cameras put out on video. Yeah, I mean, right. she only. She only like stills, but I'm like, oh, well, I'll use it for video because this thing's ridiculous. So. It is. It totally. That's what you used for that video. Yeah, absolutely. That's nuts. Yep. And I didn't. I didn't put any effects on any of those uh, those, those shots. I mm-hmm. mean, I I have yet to play around with that. We're do, we're doing a second version of that video. Oh, um, wow, okay. With, with an actual like storyline, you know, with, oh. a, with an act it out, script it out. Nice. And I think it's gonna. I think the actors in the next in this video are gonna be all all kids, which is gonna be interesting. Oh wow! Yeah, so it's gonna have an, an underlying message of uh, today's society and it kind of what what your addiction is yeah. uh, per se. Yeah. You know, cocaine's just a metaphor. Right, right, right. How much are you involved in like the the sort of business side of things, like promoting these, you know, your own stuff and the other bands on the I, label and stuff like that? I I don't. I don't do anything, to be honest. I just mm-hmm. put it out there, and I hope, you know, maybe somebody will like it. You right, know? right. I mean, you know, we, I, I always, like I said, I've booked several tours. I mean, you know, I've, I've toured, you know, I think we've toured, I don't know, 33 or four states wow. out of the whole U.S. Wow. As, as dorm life, and, you know, we've been to almost every one of them, but mm-hmm. we, but it's, uh, so I mean, I've I've always tried to take things into my own hands, but as far as promotion and all that stuff, I mean, that also takes money too. Yeah, to yeah. Sure. And uh, I'd say that with again with technology and and the capabilities nowadays, the competition is very high on, yeah. on everything. <laughs> yeah. And for me, it's not really again. It, it's just a passion, you know. Mm-hmm. I'd rather I'd rather just make a, a really good record, and you know if. You know, ten people really, really love it. Cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Other than the seven inch, have you wanted to or thought about pressing any any vinyl of this stuff? I mean, I know, you know, that really gets even more expensive. You know, if you really want to lose money. Yeah. 
start. You know, it's funny. It's funny, Jason. <laughs> like I, I sent out seven inches and yeah. I sent out the mustard album. Okay. Yeah. And I swear I've gotten more reviews for the vinyl. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it's I, like people take vinyl more seriously. I, yeah, and I and think that, that's true. That makes me want to put out vinyl. It really yeah. does. It's too bad that, you know, if I was going to press, you know, it's going to cost me basically essentially twice, twice the amount mm -hmm. that it would for a CD. Yeah. And, sure. uh, I would, I would basically have to, I mean, to justify that, I would have to have somebody else, you know, kind of helping me put that out. Right. Right. Cause you know, that's a lot of money. Honestly, though, I do I do plan on putting a couple Dorm Life records out on vinyl oh, yeah. in the next, probably for their like ten year anniversary, you know? <laughs> like just do a do nice. a vinyl release. I can, you know, yeah, 2017, yeah. we'll go back to Chicago <laughs> and do like a reunion and play Roses Are Blue and release it on vinyl. You know, so that's awesome. I remember when we got those those records, and I mean, I mm -hmm. again, Mike Park pressed those for me, yeah. you know, getting, getting his rainbow records discount, you yeah. know, and, and just on good faith that I would pay him back, you right. know, he funded the money and everything. So nice. it was, when they came in, it was just all red records and we had to make everything ourselves, the covers and everything, you know, That's awesome. and, and I remember just putting it on the record player and it was just, <laughs> wow, why yeah. didn't we just do the whole record this way? Cause it just sounds, I mean, it, it, you know, if you were to listen, I, I think if I was to put boom juice on vinyl, it wouldn't resonate the same way dorm life does. Right. I mean, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's that, it's that, you know, you can't really overproduce too much, you know, a band that has For, acoustic, yeah. you know, drums and bass, mm -hmm. you know, it's pretty tough. I mean, you're going to have to really doctor it up a lot <laughs> and, um, and add things that shouldn't be there. <laughs> and, um, so, you know, when I heard that we saw us on vinyl, I was just like, man, this is nice. Yeah. You know, it's just so beautiful. It's, uh, it's a sound. It sounds great on vinyl. I didn't think it would because we didn't record it analog, but it just came out beautiful and damn precision nailed it on the mix. So nice. We're, we're lucky. Words like bullets these days with a touch of magic and a dash of insane. And be sure to get the job done. Yeah, man. Thanks. Thanks for having me on. I oh sure appreciate it. Well, yeah, it was awesome to talk to you. Thanks for taking you know the the time out of uh, your family and, and everything to uh, to talk with Pleasure me. Pleasure to uh, you know be part of this. So. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's great to to meet you uh, online and and uh, listen to your stuff. It's excellent, man. Well, um, have a good evening. You too. Thrill left a life inside an empty glass crack and then it's filled. Time's left, ticking hand.